encourage you to take over your Bibles and study along with us this morning as we discuss a, well, all Bible subjects are important. I don't know if there's a greater subject to discuss than that is the subject of conversion. This deals with Jesus, who he is, why he came, the condition of man, the need for salvation. Of course, becoming a Christian is something that everybody needs to understand. Jesus gave the commission over in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. However, I hear so many people utter to me all the time, so-and-so is a good Christian person. Based on what? They go to church. They believe in God. They believe in Jesus. They are a kind person. They are a giving person. It's a term that is used rather loosely, the concept Christian. Folks, possessing some characteristics of a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Do you understand that? Now, that isn't popular to tell people. People want us to be politically correct or religiously correct. Obviously, they're not the same. Religiously correct, obviously, we're going, we want to be correct. But I read something this past week on a website from somebody I'm studying with, trying to help them to understand where they go and what they teach. And when I went to their website, this is what they put out there that they want everybody to read. And I quote, no person or group of persons will ever fully capture the complete revelation of God. Really? They went on to talk about how that we need to be more embracing of what other people want to believe. And I understand why they put that on their website. But Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32, you can know the truth and the truth will set you free. And of course, Paul writing to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine. Well, if you can understand it. No. For reproof. Well, if you get it. No. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have been saying for years and years and years in this community, on TV and on radio, you have a Bible question, you deserve a Bible answer. You can know what God has to say about things. The word of God is powerful is what we keep trying to get people to understand. This is why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. I've seen it. You've witnessed it, it not only in your own lives, but in the lives of others. I just, we just preach the word, and people are being pricked by it just this week. Probably what sparked this lesson, but although I did have it in mind even before Tuesday. But when you have Matt and Chris, and, and, and it, it drives home a very important principle that when you have two people that you and I know and have met and have led songs and led prayers and have taught and, and then all of a sudden call up and they say, Chuck, I think I need to get baptized. I don't think I understood what I was doing. So what are you trying to tell me? Is that Are you trying to tell me that there was a time in your life you thought you were a Christian and now you're doubting that? Yeah. Well, that's nothing new. You know, when, when you read through the scriptures, I mean, the, the New Testament, just you should go, go through the Gospels. But, you know, if you go to Acts chapter 1 and, and then Acts chapter 2 with the preaching, what do you think's happening on the day of Pentecost? The apostles are preaching to religious people. 
They are people who think they're going to heaven. Do you understand that? Now, 3,000 people obeyed the gospel on that day. What are you going to say to those 3,000 people? Now, wait a second. It wasn't just long ago before you heard them preaching. Didn't you think you were right with God? Well, yeah. Well, what changed your mind? The gospel. The message changed my mind. And so we had a couple of people this week have been they've been having some doubts. And of course, that's a simple solution, right? When you have doubts, you just remove the doubt. Now let's talk a little bit for a moment. This, you might think I'm getting off track, but I'm not. I want to read a little bit today about John the Baptist. Go to Matthew, the third chapter. Because we know in John chapter 1, I'm just going to make reference. Keep going to go to Matthew chapter 3. In John chapter 1, it tells us that John was commanded divinely. God told him to baptize people in water. Okay. That was what he was called to do. John didn't invent it. Um, it's not his doctrine. It, it was divine in its source. In Matthew, the third chapter, look at verse 1. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did you pick up on that? Jesus did the same thing. You can go over to the, the, the fourth chapter, verse 17. Jesus preaching about, um, about the kingdom. Let me just go over there, the 17th, uh, chapter 4, and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of of heaven is at hand. Okay. Back to Matthew chapter 3 and in verse 2, or verse 3, it says, For this is he who has spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Talk about John. Look at verse 4. John himself was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and the regions are, uh, around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now, let's just stop there. I could spend the rest of the morning talking about this text, but I really hope you can get it. You know, John's baptizing people. And, and the connection was, well, we're preaching about the kingdom. Well, what's so important about the kingdom? That's why Jesus was going to come. That's why he was teaching to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom is here. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The kingdom, the church, the terms are used synonymously. I'm going to be coming. The, the kingdom is coming. His spiritual kingdom. We as Christians are part of the spiritual kingdom, the church. Because I mentioned in Colossians chapter 1, when you become a Christian, the Lord puts you into his kingdom. The kingdom's here, folks. Mark 9, 1, Jesus said, some of you will not taste of death till you see the kingdom come with power. It was going to come in the lifetime of the people that Jesus was talking to at that time. And in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, he talked about, I'm going to build my church and you're going to have access to the kingdom. Church, kingdom, same thing. The church are his special people. The, those that are in the kingdom are citizens in his spiritual kingdom. What am I talking about here? Why did I bring this passage up? Well, did you notice that there were people coming out when John was baptizing? And there were other people, these Pharisees and the Sadducees, coming to his baptism who said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What are you doing here? What do you do? What? What? You want to get baptized? Is that really what you want to do? You want to get baptized? Somebody comes forward. What? Do you want? You want to get baptized? No, I, I don't presume to know the hearts of men. But the two people that we baptized this week, there was a point in time where they came forward and they want to get baptized. Do you want to get baptized? He said to them in verse eight. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Look, if, if you want to do this, you don't go through the motions. 
You, if, if you want to flee from the wrath to come, you want to get baptized, you're going to, what, you're going to come confessing your sins. Do you know about the kingdom that's coming? It's all about the kingdom. You know, there's something seriously wrong today when somebody becomes a Christian. And people will tell me this. They'll say, Chuck, can a person become a Christian and belong to a denomination? And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting because what I'm reading here is that if you're going to preach this one shot, but if you're going to preach about uh, a, a conversion, if you're going to teach about salvation, like John was doing, and baptizing them and confessing their sins, he was preaching them what? He said, well, he, he preached them about the kingdom. The kingdom is near. And so he was teaching them about conversion. And so he was talking about this idea, you, you, you need to repent of your sins. And, of course, uh, as he mentioned there, you, you're going to need to be baptized. Now, now here's what I want you to see. We're not under John's baptism. We know that. Okay. If you'll just pop over quickly to Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 18. Go to Acts chapter 18, if you would. And look at verse 24. It said, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man being instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the word of God more accurately. Now go to the 19th chapter. Now you see some examples where people were baptized under John. See, Jesus has already died and went back to heaven. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sins. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 1, it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And then he wondered. He said, well, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, well, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who will come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what we just pointed out here is some people. This was after Jesus had died. But I'm wanting you to see the big picture here. When John was baptizing people, he wanted them to repent. There was a connection there, fleeing the wrath to come and preaching about the kingdom. When you and I preach today, you know, obviously we're not under John's baptism. We're under Christ. And so what are we going to do? We're going to preach. We're going to preach Christ. OK, which is important. And we're obviously going to be talking about the church, his kingdom. We'll put that hand in hand. You know, when somebody becomes a Christian, you say, well, do you know what church you belong to? I haven't even heard whether there is a church. What are you talking about? I could parallel that with 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 Paul running into some people and they're talking. To, well, have you heard about the Holy Spirit? We haven't even heard. Well, what were you baptized under? Well, under John's baptism. No, no. You need to be baptized under Christ's baptism. So he didn't understand. And so if you run into somebody today and you, you, you talk to them and you say, well, you know, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, I'm a Christian. What church do you go? Do I go to this denomination over here? What? 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 That, what are you talking about there? That just some, something's not right there. So that connection was being made, and we need to see it because what I want to talk about today. Get this. I want to talk to you this morning. Is that there are lots of people, and don't be. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get you guys to question whether you're a Christian or not. If you're a Christian, that's wonderful. I don't want to cast doubt when you've done the right thing. What I want you to do, though, is examine yourself, like 2 Corinthians 13, 5, whether you are truly a Christian. You say, well, I don't even want to question that. Wait a second. This past week, we had two people that, that called me up and were baptized right away. Why? Because they have thinking about their past and... They've heard me talk about the right combination, but today we're going to be talking about the wrong combinations that are out there. So you can make sure. But if you go listen to this lesson today, don't beat yourself up if you say, man, I thought I was a Christian all this time. I did. 
at one time when I was studying with some people, I thought I was a Christian. And I started studying the scriptures. I found that man, I was wrong. I had the wrong combination. I think Trey would just Google this. 64,000? 64,000 different combinations to open that lock, okay? There's 64,000 different combinations. Do you know there are scores of combinations that people are teaching out there for you to become a Christian, but only one is the right one? Really? Yeah. That's why you had 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost that says, whoa, we can't stay in Judaism. We thought that was pleasing to God. They found out they were wrong. Apollos preaching the wrong combination. A couple takes him aside in Acts 18. In Acts 19, runs into some people. Hey, we recently obeyed. We're okay. We're fine with the Lord. Uh, no, you're not. We're not. Well, they didn't sit there and go, oh, man, he taught us wrong. Or it doesn't matter. I mean, does it? Well, we're going to talk about the right combination in a moment. We're going to find out that it does matter. But I just want you to understand that there are scores of people in Bible times that thought that they were right with the Lord and they weren't. So why would you be so surprised to find out if you might be one of those people that think you're right with the Lord when you're really not? Don't be surprised. Chances are for those of you that are right with the Lord actually went through that already. Well, there was a time in your life where you thought you were okay, but you obeyed from the heart. Romans 6, 17. And so today as we go through this lesson, I want you to be thinking about the right combination. And were you converted? You know, there's only four. There's not 664,000 combinations. Okay, there's not 64,000 combinations. Four. Now, within these four... There's some variables that people have created that creates even more confusion. We're going to clear it all up, but here it is. There are four combinations that are being taught out there that are trying to tell people you're saved if you do number one. You're saved if you do number two. You're saved even if you do number three. Now, they're not calling it wrong. I'm telling you from a biblical point of view that there are wrongs out there. I'm going to show you from the scriptures. But you do understand, though, folks, conversion is crucial. I don't want any of you. I'm sure I'm sure you're not wanting the Lord to come back and find out that you're not prepared. We always say, Mark says, you know, if you've got any questions, you're going to be our friend. If we're teaching something wrong and you bring it to our attention, why wouldn't I appreciate that? Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to be teaching error. I don't want to miss heaven. I don't want to go through life thinking I'm okay when I'm not. And see, that's what was bothering Matt and uh, Chris this week. They're like thinking, you know what? I've got some doubt in my mind. They didn't have a problem with the right mode. It's the wrong reason. But it might be some of these other things that maybe it's you. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't presume to know your condition but i know that the bible will describe what is the right combination and i want you to be asking yourself as we go through this lesson 15 minutes left not much of not much time out of your life to examine so let's go through this first of all obey that form of doctrine romans chapter 6 and verse 17 you've heard me quote that before a form it's something that is set um, if there's some passages that you missed, don't forget, you can go back to your computer and bring up this on our, on your computer, go to our website. This lesson is being taped, but that form of doctor, remember there's a common salvation, Jude three, common salvation folks. And if you're saved and I'm saved, then we've done the same thing. If we differ, one of us is wrong or we're both wrong, what well, we both can't be right. So what's the right mode? Well, in Acts chapter 8, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? In Acts chapter 10, when we looked at Cornelius a few weeks ago, can anybody forbid water that these might be baptized? The word baptize means to immerse, to bury. It doesn't mean, well, 
We're going to talk about the wrong ones in a moment, okay? So we're, we're going to talk about the rights, the right right now. And then we're going to talk about some of the wrong modes that are taught and some of the wrong reasons. But let me just cover the right, uh, the right mode and, and, uh, and the right reasons, okay? The passages are down. I'm, I'm making reference to them as I go through this. But yeah, in Acts chapter 8, they went down into the water and he baptized him. Well, look, I'll have that list for you in a moment. So, but you, but you need to get this. That, that's Romans chapter 6. You need to be buried with Christ. What do you do with a dead body? You bury it. If you take some water, well, again, that's the wrong one. I'm going to stick with the right one. I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's what we see the right mode in water. The right reason. What? For the remission of sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be saved. Did you get that? There's the right reason. I want to become a, a Christian today. I want my sins washed away by the blood of Christ. We talked about that in our Bible study this morning, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Redemption is found in Christ, his blood. All right, you need to come in contact with his blood, which is the through the right way. That was Romans chapter 6. You're buried with him. You're baptized into his death. Repent and be baptized. Acts 2 and verse 38. For what? The remission of your sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. People get baptized in Jesus Christ, into Jesus Christ for what? To be saved. <laughs> to be faithful in their sins. They need to be converted. Now, that's, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Well, the problems come when people want to change different things. Different combination. Like what? Well, what are some of the wrong modes? Sprinkle to pour. Somebody will say, well, I've been baptized in the spirit. What are you talking about? You're baptized in the water. You know, I understand what, what people are saying about different things, but you need to understand to pour water on somebody or to sprinkle water on somebody, it's the wrong mode. That, that is not a proper mode for baptism. And we need to be careful of this. And, and people teach these things. And so they'll do those combinations. And let me get this next one up here, and then we'll talk about them all. What are some wrong reasons? Well, number one, to show you're already a Christian. I gave my life to the Lord a few years ago, or I gave my life to the Lord last week, and you know, and they had a baptismal service. No, no. They'll say it's an outward sign of an inward grace. Not in the Bible. It's a nice cliche people came up with. To join a church. I got baptized to join the church. That's what I did here. No, no, you didn't. You hope not. You know, you don't get baptized to join the church. To please family and friends. Or it's a church ordinance for babies. It's about that time. We're going to bring the baby up, and they're going to have a christening. That's what you do. Doing it and hopefully learn why, why, why later. Uh, some people say, well, I was baptized as a baby, but now that I understand it, okay, now everything's covered. Well, no, no, you, you need to understand at the time. Now, how do you know that? From Acts chapter 19. They had just been immersed in water for the wrong reason under John's baptism. Why didn't Paul just say, well, you were just immersed. It's covered now that you have the understanding. No, you have to have the understanding at that time. To participate in a baptismal cer uh, ceremony. There's no such thing. You know, this this past week, I got two phone calls. Wait, I got to call a bunch of people. Matt, I got to get a lot of people. No, no, no. Go to the bed. Other, we just we just did it. There's not a ceremony that, that yeah, you don't have to wear certain clothing. But see, people will, will change it around, and there are all kinds of combinations that are being taught out there. And people are convinced that their baptism is right because they've read the verses in the Bible. But I'm telling you, folks, and this is why I'm studying with this person, because I'm wanting them to know that although they quote the same verses I do, you need to understand exactly what they're teaching. Setting up an appointment. Repent and be baptized. They did it immediately. And that's what we did this week. Immediately took care of it for the right reasons. Now, what we need to do is we need to think about this a little bit. And I have some more charts. We've got plenty of time to, to cover these things. But remember these, okay? Remember these passages. 1 Peter 3.21. People, people say baptism has nothing to do with salvation. 
1 Peter 3, 21, baptism does also now save us. All right. I'm going to go over this passage over here in Colossians chapter 2. I don't read that one too often, but Ephesians, or Philippians and Colossians chapter 2. Look what it says here in verse 11. He says, in him, in Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, now there's a reason why I brought up John the Baptist earlier and with what we're reading here. You know why sometimes people who think they're Christians and later on when they get older and they study the scriptures more and they'll say to themselves, you know what? I don't think my baptism was valid. And I say, well, why? And a person has said to me in the past, they said, well, when I came up out of the waters of baptism, I didn't change. I just thought it was something to just do. Said, no, no. Remember, remember those who came uh, when John the Baptist, who, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You do fruits meet for repentance. Is there really a change in your life? You know, when somebody is really young, that, that's the danger. When you get baptized when you're young, you go, I want to get baptized, Miss Bartlett. Okay, just, okay, all right, this is great. And I'm going out. Nothing has changed in their mind, but they've turned and they're going to follow Jesus. I've put out that old man. I'm not doing those things anymore. I'm going to change. I'm going to watch my mouth. I'm going to watch my habits. I'm going to watch a lot of different things. I'm a changed person because I buried that old man. People don't even get that. People don't understand that it's a change. You're putting on a new person. And you've got to be old enough to comprehend that. And you need to be convicted enough, like those uh, were being told with John the Baptist. You know, you need to do fruits, meat for repentance. Are you going to change? You know, sometimes people go down in the waters of baptism and they have no intention of giving up certain things. Was that you? You might say, well, yeah, but after a few years later, I decided, you know what? I'm going to quit that habit. Well, didn't you have that attitude when you became a Christian? Well, not really. You got the wrong combination, folks. You need to make sure that you have that maturity and that understanding of what the Bible's talking about. Now, what we're noticing is that there are people who think they are converted because they believe. Look, at they did. But they just didn't want to confess him. They believed who Jesus was. They didn't want to confess him. There are people who pray. Cornelius is a praying man, but he wasn't a Christian. He needed to wor hear words by which he and his household will be saved. You might believe and you might pray. It doesn't make you a Christian. People who repent. Saul went into the city. He decided, I'm not going to kill Christians anymore. Or I'm not going to persecute them. He goes into the city. Was he saved? No. Preacher came to him and said, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. Hey, I've repented. Remember the bulletin last week? Just stop sinning doesn't mean you're converted. You've got some converting to be done. People who confess. The demons confessed who Jesus was. They confessed him. You son of God. Did you come here to judge us before the time? I mean, if you're just going to confess who Jesus is, it doesn't mean you're converted. I think it's great that you might believe in Jesus and willing to confess him. What about people who worship? You're worshiping God today. You've probably done it a lot. You see, Matt and Chris could go down this and say, hey, I believe in Jesus. And they say, well, you know, we've worshiped God and never missed. But Acts 8 verse 27, Cornelius was a person. You need to be a person who worships God. Um, Cornelius was a religious man, of course. He mentions that in the first two verses. People who were immersed in water. I was immersed in water. Man, I used that argument when I was studying with Christians. I thought I was a Christian, and they kept bringing up the plan of salvation. I kept saying, what? I've been immersed in water. Well, a lot of people get immersed in water, but they only got wet. See, Matt and Chris were immersed in water. Immersed. What are these guys doing? It? What, what, what are you doing? What are you calling me up for? Well, because they understand that you can just get wet. I don't want you guys to get wet. I don't want to be wet. I need to make sure that I have the right combination and I'm faithful to the Lord. 
people who stop sinful habits, I just talked about that a moment ago. Oops. Now, baptism, get these, these facts are important. Baptism does not follow a conversion. Somebody comes forward and says, you know what? I realized I have not obeyed the gospel. Matter of fact, I just thought it was just something that the church taught. And I was right in, I was in denominationalism. Remember this? You know, why anybody would become a Christian and go right into sin? It was just, was, were you taught about the church? Did you understand about Christ having all authority and he's the head of the body, his special people? Did you really understand that? You need to see that connection that is there. Baptism is only valid when one meets the prerequisites. You need to understand that. If a person doesn't believe who Jesus is, remember in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian pointed and he said, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? I'll tell you, there's a lot of things that can hinder people from being baptized. Number one, if you're not willing to put off the old man. That's what we talked about in our Bible study this morning. When Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Well, Paul's not going to try to get somebody to get under that water if they're not ready to be fully persuaded. You can talk people in it. I've seen it happen. Breaks my heart. I saw a guy, a guy I've been studying with for a long time, who called me up and said, Chuck, I want to become a Christian right now. I want to be baptized. Okay. So he brings his brother-in-law. Never darkened the doors ever. Never had a Bible study. Comes in there, and I'm getting things ready because I know this guy that I've been studying with, and, and we're getting ready to, to, to baptize him. Meanwhile, this other preacher works on this guy, works on him, and works on him. You need to get baptized. You need to get baptized. Your brother-in-law said, you need to get baptized. Baptize him. Never, ever, ever saw him again. You can talk people into it. Why? If they don't want to do it, you don't tell them to do it. That's, by the way, one of the, one of the things we do with our kids. So how do I know when my kids are old enough? Well, tell your kids, well, do it, do it later. Oh, okay. Well, see, they, they know. If you can talk them out of it, even an adult, you can talk them out of it. They're not ready. A person that fully understands it, you can't talk them out of it. I want to do it. Now, there is only one. There is something wrong if someone is baptized and directly attends a man-made religious sect. Did you get that? There's something seriously wrong when somebody says, I want to become a Christian, and I'm going to go to a man-made organization. Man started it. It wasn't Christ. There's something seriously wrong there. And I just talked about that in verse 5. To pressure someone to be baptized without conviction, something is wrong. People who get <laughs> baptized properly understand the reasons why. And do not want to put it off. Did you get that? person must hear the gospel, believe in Jesus Christ, repent, which means change their mind. That's all it means. I've decided I want to follow Jesus. And I'll confess. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. What the most confession is made unto salvation. And then you baptize them. And what happens? Is there, some, is there some power in the water? There's no power in the water. The power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But getting all the way back, if I can go all the way back here now to our, to our first slide. There's only one right combination. It's called a common salvation. And if Warren says to me, Chuck, I'm a Christian, I'll say, really, Warren? I know what you did. Really? You weren't there. Well, I know what you did. You must have heard the gospel. Well, yeah, Chuck, I did. And then at one point, you believed what you were hearing. Mm -hmm. You realized you were lost in sin. Yeah. And you decided you wanted to turn and follow Jesus. Right. And then you were asked, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You said yes, and you confessed your faith in him. Chuck, I did that. And then you were baptized immediately for the remission of your sins. Well, how did you know that? Because that's what the Bible says. And if you're a Christian, I can say, well, you did that too. And if you're sitting there going, um, no, it wasn't like that, Chuck. Really? Is there another way? Well, I'd already given my life to the Lord for years, and then I was later baptized. Eh, wrong. Wrong combination. Well, I wanted to show everybody that I was already a Christian. Eh, wrong combination. Well, I did it to join a local church. Eh, wrong combination. I was sprinkled. Wrong. Baptized as a baby. Wrong. You said there's just all these different combinations. There's only one combination that works. And I want to ask you, because I don't know. You didn't get, you didn't see me. Did anybody here see, see me get baptized? I was in Canada. None of you did. 
before I even met Debbie. Nobody, nobody here has seen. So you say, well, Chuck, how do we know you're a Christian? You don't, do you? Take my word for it. But this is what I preach, the Bible teaches, and I did what it said. So here's my question to you. It is a question for me, too. Did I, did you do it the way the Bible says? If the answer is no, and you understand what is expected of you, then you can fix that immediately. If the answer is no, but you still have some questions, okay. That means you're not ready yet, but we'll talk about it. And when, the, when, when you do understand, you take care of it. It's as simple as that. Don't make it more complicated because here's what the devil wants from you. Take over your song book. We're going to be singing number 31 in two seconds. Let me a little longer. The devil wants you to say it doesn't matter. The, bio, the devil wants you to think, but you love the Lord. Or the devil's going to say, ah, put it off. You put it off this long. We're talking about your soul. Jesus, what does a prophet of man who gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Your soul is that valuable, more than all the riches of this world. You're not a Christian. My question is, why wouldn't you want to be? The answers are many, though. Why? I don't want to. Okay. But for those who want to, all things are ready. And if you don't want to, but yet you say, I'd like to, let's study. Let's talk. There's power in the gospel. It'll prick the heart. I'm convinced of the power of it. But if you're sub the invitation in any way, you've got some questions, a little bit of doubt. And sometimes the doubt you have can be cleared up by saying, you know, one lady said to me time, one time, she said, Chuck, I, I think I need to get baptized again. I said, why? She goes, I told you before in another sermon, she said, well, all I can remember when I came up out of the water is I felt wet. I said, me too. Oh, that's normal? Yes. Okay, you're good. Okay, so your little bit of doubt can be cleared up. You might say something. Just, I, thought there was, I thought you were supposed to hear voices from heaven. No, no, no. no. Okay. But you might have a question that causes a little bit of doubt. Don't leave. Ask it. We'll help clear it up. We'll use our Bible. If you're subject to it anyway, let it be known as we stand together and sing the song that was announced. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some sort to say. closing word of prayer of my brother Dave. I'd like to thank all of our visitors for coming today and, and listening to the message today. A, a simple message, the gospel is not complicated, but a man likes to make it that way. And so we try to study and uh, understand what, the, what his will is for us so we can 
to make sure that we're following that. So we're thankful that you're here with uh, with uh, your mind on worshiping God, and we're thankful. We've, hopefully, we've all been edified here by singing songs of praise and and uh, praying to God uh, for each other and for just support as we uh, we strive for heaven. Are there any other announcements, Ben, that we need to make before we're dismissed at this time? And we'll be back again at 4 o'clock this afternoon, so you have an opportunity to be back with us. Please come. Uh, Dave, will you now lead us in a closing word of prayer? <clears throat> bow with me. Our dear and most loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for this fortune for good health that we have that we were able to come together with the body of Christ this day to worship you and to sing songs of praises unto the holy name and to study another portion of thy word, dear Father. And we're so thankful for all the many wonderful blessings that you so abundantly bestow upon us each and every day. This, especially the spiritual blessings, dear Father, and we're so thankful for your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus, who was willing to come upon this earth and give his life on that cruel cross of Calvary because of his love for us, dear Father. And that's why we come together, because of our love for you, dear Father, and for our love for Jesus and his blessed example that he lived his life uh, all the temptations that confronted him, dear Father, and yet he remained faithful to the very end. And we look at other examples in the Bible, too, of those faithful people that lived their lives faithful to the very end. And we want to pattern our lives, dear Father, after that. We want to serve you each and every day and live our lives obedient unto the very end, dear Father. So that when you come, dear Father, or when Jesus comes for the second and final time, we may hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye in through the gate. Now, dear Father, we pray for those that are traveling, and we pray that they have a safe trip to their destination and that they might be able to return safely to us, dear Father. And we pray, dear Father, for Sister Tina and her. Uh, continuing, continual healing, dear Father, that uh, in the very near future she may be without any pain, be they will, and be the, with us as we depart from here. And we pray, dear Father, that as we're out in this world of darkness, that our lights will so shine that others will see you through us and you will always receive all the glory. Forgive us, dear Father, when we sin and fall short and we need to make the necessary correction and that's called repentance. And if we do these things, dear Father, we will be living according to your will. And forgive us, dear Father, we sin and fall short. In Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 Yeah.